in the third week of our Advent series, and as you know, I'm treating this a little different than you will see it in mainstream Christianity. The idea is the same. The Advent is the expectation of the coming Messiah, and that's the, the symbolic meaning of it. It's the Advent of the Christ, the Advent of the Messiah. And in the mainstream Christian scholarship, the, the words Christ and Messiah are synonymous. We don't make a distinction between them. They're both titles, and they have, were attributed by the early church to the man Jesus. So as we sing our traditional Christmas songs, which are very nice, the... Uh, it comes out of mainstream Christian theology. So when we sing Christ is born in Bethlehem, we're talking about Jesus, the man, obviously. And in a more spiritual approach, we say that Christ is the spiritual essence of each person, that Jesus demonstrated that. And if we are to learn something from him, it is learn how to do that. As he said, the things I do, you can do also in greater things. It doesn't sound like he was putting himself above the rest of us when he made a statement like this. And so it's a real sound, debatable issue as to whether or not Jesus considered himself the Messiah or the Christ if he adopted those titles for himself. And of course, we can read the gospel accounts and find that they say he did. But we have to remember, we do not have a gospel according to Jesus. We've got four gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and of course, Paul. And Paul's not an official gospel writer, he's a letter writer. But his message is very clear about how he perceives Jesus. So we make that distinction. It's important to make that distinction. And what I have done is uh, taken the Advent series and proposed it as a build-up to this birth or awakening of this spiritual dimension in us. We have a personal awakening to our spiritual dimension. And so the wreath that we have here, and I know that several of you have been here through the whole series and but I want to just uh, kind of reiterate what what this all means the wreath that you see up here it represents God the eternal with no beginning no end the idea of the evergreen and the circle uh, it's symbolic of we are in the presence of something eternal we are in the presence of something that has no beginning and no end, and we're part of that presence. And that part is expressed as the center candle, which we call the Christ or the soul, the I am, our center of power, our spiritual identity, call it whatever you want, but it is the eternal manifesting and expressing, individualizing as each one of us and every living thing is a projection of this underlying power, of this underlying source. And I have gone over uh, for several years now the idea that this universal power, this source that we call God, is basically composed of four fundamental elements. And the first is life. And that's what the first green candle that I lit represents. The second is love. We say God is love. Uh, love dissolves that which is not for our highest good and draws that which is. It's a twofold action. Today we're looking at power which manifests through our consciousness as strength. Strength of faith, strength to lift up our eyes and see something higher than whatever problem we may be going through. And next week we will close this series with the idea of intelligence. God is light. God is intelligence. So we 
look at this graph, and we see those four elements that uh, make up the universal presence of God, this underlying creative life force in which we live and move and have our being, it expresses, individualizes as the soul. And then we express that through our personal consciousness. If we didn't have a personal consciousness, we would all look alike. We would all have the same desires, the same interests. Uh, we would all see ourselves much the same. And I've compared this to look at 100,000, a herd of 100,000 wildebeest. And they all have a consciousness, but they don't have the creative imagination that we have. So they express pretty much the same. If you know one wildebeest, you pretty much know them all. They probably do have differences in personalities, but um, the human being is the most profound in this regard. And so we all express in different ways, but we draw from the same source. It's like we draw from a palette of colors and we paint different pictures depending on what our interest is. But we draw from the same palette, and that is what we call God. You can call it whatever you want. I like the creative life force. So we're focusing on these four different elements each week, and today is power. And power manifests in a wide range of ways from the unfathomable power of the sun to the simple unfolding of a leaf. That creative life force is power. When you take time to be still and you turn your awareness to that energy of life, that you are something is powering you, something is, you know, you're not powered by AAA batteries. You probably have a closet full of those things, but you don't need those. You're powered by something that is unseen, something that's pretty miraculous. Your whole being is powered. And how we use that power will depend on how we think. It will depend on the ideas that we hold. Jesus gave a, a good illustration of this, and I've been writing about this, doing an article that may be, may be part of a book later on. But I was thinking about this uh, incident where he told the disciples, uh, actually, they, he was hungry and they came up on a fig tree and he went over to the fig tree to get some fruit and it was barren. So he cursed it and the fig tree withered up. And I don't want to go into that story. That's a whole different thing. It's kind of a controversial thing. Why would he do something like that? It showed that he was a little bit angry that the fig tree was not producing and so he cursed it and it withered up. But the the essence of the story is he used that as an example. You know, it's possible for you to be able to do this. He was talking to the disciples. But he said, you can look at a mountain and you can say to the mountain, be rooted up and cast into the sea. And if you say that and do not doubt in your heart that this is so, it will come to pass. Whoever has faith, uh, to do this, it will come to pass. So that whole story is about power. It's about how to use power. And if we have a mountain in our life, the mountain obviously is symbolic. It's, he was using it as a, an illustration to get attention because it's such a bizarre image. You know, none of us have seen a mountain be cast up and thrown into the sea. Can you imagine the tsunami that would create? It wouldn't be too popular if we did that. So he's not talking about mountains. He's talking about problems. You have a problem in your life, and you're treating it like something that's insurmountable. It's a mountain that uh, you can't get around. So he's saying, instead of looking at it that way, you have the power to change that picture. You can actually see yourself pulling that mountain out of the ground and throwing it into the sea. In other words, the problem that you have, it is a problem because of how you are seeing it, how you are using your power. You are saying, this is a mountain that is insurmountable, so I have a problem. 
And what he's doing is saying, there's another way to handle this. There's another way to look at it. And you're not tapping your resources. So to imagine rooting up this mountain and casting it into the sea, what faculty is he suggesting we're using here? How many of you saw the mountain being cast, rooted up and cast into the sea in your mind as I just now mentioned it? What faculty were you using? Your imagination. That's the first thing. And then he says if you see that and have faith that it's done, that's the second faculty. Imagination first, faith is second. And then to act as if this is true, first of all, we're looking at this mountain and saying, I can't get around it. That's a judgment call. We're using our faculty of judgment in a negative way. So he's saying, let's take the faculty of judgment and redefine it. Not redefine the faculty, but redefine how we're using it. And we redefine how we're using it by imagining our mountain flying to the sea. So the judgment call now is maybe it's not insurmountable. We're changing the way we're, judge we're using our faculty of judgment. And what about will? You can imagine casting this mountain into the sea and then feeling good about it and five minutes later fearing it again. So it requires will to stay on track. He says, if you see this happen and do not doubt in your heart, well, you cannot doubt in your heart for five minutes, but what about six minutes? We all know that how easy it is to get off track once we set a spiritual course for ourselves, once we set a, a direction for ourselves, it's very easy to get sidetracked. So it requires the fourth faculty, which I, I call executive faculties because we decide how we're going to use them. That's will. You have to will yourself to bring your faith back. And then the fifth one is elimination, the power to eliminate. And what do we eliminate? We eliminate the negative energy that we put into it. You can visualize something and still feel bad, still feel like something's wrong. And what that feeling is, is energy. It's stored energy in your consciousness. And so the faculty of elimination is designed to go in and sweep that out. But it must be a conscious effort at first. So it's a very powerful um, picture. But he's not talking about mountains and he's not talking about the sea. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. He's talking about the problems that we have labeled as insurmountable. And probably every one of us have one of those, or two or three or a dozen. We have these things that we are picturing in our minds. Every time we think about them, we tighten up. So this is an opportunity to use a spiritual formula to change that, to change how we are relating to this mental and emotional image that we carry. And by making these changes, by using our imagination to throw this mountain into the sea and to commit to holding our faith, we're drawing upon these four resources, life, love, power, and intelligence. We're opening the door for these to behave differently through us. And one of the things I point out in this, or I'm working on pointing out in this article is that Prayer is not about changing God. As I pointed out a couple weeks ago, you know, you're having a bad day. So is a bad day something that just comes and hits us all at the same time? Or if you're having a bad day and you go out and talk to 10 of your neighbors in your neighborhood and say, are you having a good day or a bad day? 
Well, what if seven of them say, I'm having a fantastic day, but you're having a bad day, so you pray to God, would you please spin the universe just a little faster so we can get through this? But what about the seven that are having the good day? They want to relish every moment of this day. So they wouldn't pray that way. They wouldn't try to get God to do something different than God's doing now in terms of how fast the universe is turning. If you just put that in perspective, prayer is not about changing God or getting God to behave differently. God, I've got this mountain in, my, in front of me and I need it removed. Would you please get on the job? Maybe the mountain's not in front of me. Maybe it is in my consciousness. Maybe it's my mountain. Maybe it's my perception. That's what he's saying. Because there's no record of anybody ever doing what he is suggesting here. We have moved mountains. I was uh, watching one of the programs on Peru and Machu Picchu and uh, that area where these people did some incredible feats of architecture with stones and all, but they were showing the top of this mountain or this mountain that had, you know, 14,000 feet. That's a, that's Mount Evans. It's really up there. We've got how many 14ers here? F uh, 53, I think, in Colorado. But they took this, a huge chunk out of that mountain to build their city, you know, to build their towns. It just and at the time they did it, at that altitude and just all the things combined, some people are absolutely sure it was UFO assisted. <laughs> and now that the Air Force has come out with this uh, report that maybe there is something to this stuff, well, maybe they did. Who knows? But they did it. Somebody did it. That, that's a literal mountain being moved. But you do not ever see somebody just walking one down one of our mountain trails and saying, this thing is too high. I think I'll cast it into the sea. It just doesn't happen. So what is this mountain? When he says that, he's talking about something you're holding in your consciousness, something you're perceiving. You have your own mountain. You have your own interpretation of what that is. So if it's yours, it's not God's, it's not your neighbor's. So only you can do something about it. That's the whole thing. That's the whole thing where power comes in. You don't need literal power to remove a physical mountain. You have the power to remove the mountain that's in your mind. Whatever it is, that's the lesson. It's like, let's don't get hung up on the images. Let's don't let the imagination run wild. That's been the problem. Something comes up and it looks like it's bigger than we are and so we make it an insurmountable obstacle. So even if it is literally an insurmountable obstacle, let's stop calling it that. We begin with this idea that I have the power to throw this thing into the sea. Now, I don't know how to do that right now. But he says, if you have faith and do not doubt in your heart, that's not instantaneous. That's a way of thinking. It's a way of life. It's a process. You don't just suddenly take the problem that you have in your life and walk away from it or change it, change your, the energy that you put into it. You first of all have to say, well, maybe the way I've been seeing this has not been complete. Maybe there's more to this than I'm thinking about. You can take kind of an intellectual approach to it. Maybe I could change my thinking about this. And maybe I don't know how it's going to come out. I don't know how this mountain's going to be cast away. But the beginning of solving the problem is changing your mind. The word prayer from Aramaic slotha means to make an adjustment. Are we asking God to make an adjustment? God, don't you see I'm suffering here? Would you please fix it? I've been good. I read three books of the Bible yesterday. So I deserve something, don't I? Don't I deserve some benefit from, 
for my behavior. And God is basically sitting back, kind of scratching his head, saying, you know, I'm, I put this thing together and it's working pretty well. Maybe you are out of sync with something. And maybe I've given you the power and authority to put yourself back in sync, to make an adjustment. So that's what we're doing. And this whole thing of Advent looking for a Savior to come outside of us, it's the same thing. We're hoping somebody will move that mountain for us. How can somebody move a perception from your mind unless you're willing to give it up, unless you're willing to let go? Jesus could return. You know, he came the first time, and apparently these people all had mountains in their minds. So he did not remove those. He doesn't have the power to do that. And the mainstream Christian will call that a horrible statement because Jesus can do anything. He can't remove your mountain from your mind. If he could, he would have. But that wasn't his mission. His mission was to tell us that we can do that, that we have that ability. And here's how to do it. And he gave a lot of examples on how to change your mind, how to look at that mountain in a different way and process it differently. So Advent truly is the advent of our own enlightenment, our own spiritual awakening that shows us we have the power right now to move the mountain, whatever that is. Power rises in our being as physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual strength. We call on strength to hold a steady course, to take one more step when our world seems to crumble around us. Have you ever had such a devastating blow in your life that you felt you couldn't take another step? Or you just were faced with something you didn't know how to handle, and it, day after day goes by and you just feel powerless to do anything about it. And then one day something happens. You say to yourself, I've backed up as far as I can go. And either my life has come to an end and it's worthless. Everything I've done is meaningless. Or something's going to change. Something new is going to happen. That's the first step. That is seeing the mountain rooted up and cast into the sea. But you have to hold to that. You have to hold to that idea. You want to hold to that. But it's kind of interesting when you're not pushed as far back as you can possibly be, sometimes you won't push back. Sometimes you won't say, I could do this because I have no choice. Sometimes when you have no choice, that's when you decide you're going to act. And we don't like to be there. It's a, actually a very horrible feeling to have is I have no choice in my life. But Jesus in this simple teaching is saying you always have a choice. You begin to use your imagination and your faith in ways that change what's going on inside of you, that begin to change your mountain, change the characteristics, the whole nature of your mountain. It is movable. And you've got the power to do it. So when power rises in our being as physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual strength, I would imagine every one of us in this room have had that experience. We went back as far as we can go. We can't go any further. And suddenly we get our second wind. Suddenly we get a new sense that there's hope, that there's an opportunity. And sometimes maybe we pick up a book and read a line or we read a daily word or we come to church or we have some interaction and something reminds us of this truth. And it changes the way we feel about everything. And that feeling level is very important because that, there's so much that happens at that level. The feeling level, that's our intuition. If your intuition is blocked off, through fear, then you're not using one of the most powerful faculties you have. 
Intuition is the gate that is that opens us to our spiritual resources. And if you're walking around with a feeling of fear all the time, your intuition is, the aperture of your intuition is shut down. Very small. Never completely, but very small. So one day you get your second wind and that aperture opens up. I don't know how I'm going to solve this problem. I don't know what the answer is, but I know there's an answer. And so you hold to that, you hold that picture, you see that mountain being cast into the sea, and you hold that, that's your savior. That's the savior we're looking for, and many people will scoff at this. But I believe this is exactly what Jesus taught. He was not saying, look at me, I'm your savior. I'm the one that's going to fix your problems. If he was the one that was going to fix their problems, why didn't he overthrow the Romans? Why didn't he put the Jews in their place that were anti-new thought, new thinking? Why didn't he take some action to fix the problems of that day? And why, when he was crucified, did the Roman Empire continue to steamroll over all Christians and Jews? Why did that happen if he was a savior? And the answer that they've come up with is, well, he's coming back. He's going to come back. He's going to fix it then. It's not going to happen. The Advent is an internal awakening. It is an internal experience that we all can have. We steady our faith in the well-being of a loved one. This is thinking, uh, what does power do? How does power manifest through us? It gives us the ability to steady our faith in the well-being of a loved one. You've got somebody that's having a struggle in their life. You fear? No. You call on power. You call on your spiritual powers to steady your faith in the well-being of the loved one. That's the mountain that you're going to cast into the sea. You see them as whole and free. You see them in a different light. I've said before that when you're praying for somebody's healing, praying for the healing of a loved one, the first thing you do is ask them to forgive you for holding a picture of them as sick. Because in truth they are not, their body may be, but the essence of who they are is not sick, never has been, never can be. And so again, our prayer is to make an adjustment. They, their body may be sick at this moment. Their body's going through this problem. But that which they are, their essence is whole and it is free. And I see that coming forth now through that body. They take command of the body. And they express the, the life and the power and the love and the intelligence that is their birthright through that body. So I ask for their forgiveness. Forgive me for seeing you as sick as a limited being, you are now whole and free. On the spiritual path, we want our minds to shoot to, okay, that's the appearance, but what is the truth? Am I judging righteously? Am I judging right judgment? Am I seeing the surface or am I seeing the truth of the depth of this individual? And so I begin to affirm your healing essence is coming forth now. Your body is whole and balanced and expressing light and just whatever you can come up with that feels right about what you know of the spiritual principles. But it's so easy to buy into that there's a mountain over there. Let's pray about it. But Jesus doesn't say, let's start a prayer circle about this mountain. He says, here's what you do. You begin to envision. You visualize it being cast into the sea. And you're saying that it's going to be. You're exercising your power. It's another way to think about yourself. That's what he's saying. So we steady our faith in the well-being of a loved one. Strength may manifest as the courage to make an apology. Or it may express as the power to say no to behavior we know is destructive. 
And that behavior could be somebody else's. It could be ours. We say no to it. And it takes strength sometimes to say no to destructive behavior, our own or someone else's. But that's how it manifests. And as we affirm power, then we're given the right words, we're given the right state of mind, we're given the right opportunity to express that, to make it known. So today we're looking at some affirmations for strength. I am an expression of pure power. Let's say that together. I am an expression of pure power. That's a shift in perception. And just hold that idea, hold that thought. I am an expression of pure power. The full radiance of my soul empowers me to steadfastness in all that I am and all that I do. Let's say that together. The full radiance of my soul empowers me to steadfastness in all that I am and all that I do. My strength is boundless. My power has no limits. Together. My strength is boundless. My power has no limits. Okay. So let's just hold some of these ideas this week. I, uh, I love that mountain analogy and how Jesus used it. Sometimes we read these things and our mind just skips right over it. That's the, the value to me of writing is it makes me look at something in a little deeper way. And I always find something of value that I didn't see before. Almost every time I can write about the same thing. So I would recommend, you know, writing as a therapy in, in that regard. It's a very helpful way to get in touch with what's this really saying? What's the message here? What is Jesus conveying? Is he saying I'm the Savior or you're the Savior? And I think it always comes back to us. All right. Thanks for coming out. Stay warm. See you next week. One, two, three, four. This Christmas morn, I'm searching for truth, who I really am. Birth of a baby made me think maybe I might be more just as man. Found that I could dance higher than the stars or the moon. Learned that I could fly without wings, without sky. I will be my light passing through. I am Christmas Day. I'm a brand new way. I go singing with the angels and dancing with the Come here.
here to help us the whole year to bless each other, everyone. Jesus has come here to help us the whole year to bless each other, everyone. You've been watching a talk given by Rev. Doug Bottorf here at Independent Unity in beautiful Grand Junction, Colorado. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. It really helps us spread our message. If you would like to support us, you can do so by clicking the button in the right-hand corner of the video screen. We greatly appreciate your support. Thanks again for watching.